So hello everyone and welcome back to Retention Chronicles. Super excited for our two guests today. I was telling them before we hopped on the call that it's the first time that we have someone from both product and marketing on together. So I think it's gonna be a great time. So welcome Emily and Mason. Thank you both so much for joining us. I'm gonna ask you both to do an intro. So Emily, let's get started with you. Can you give us a quick background um, on what you do and uh, where you're tuning in from today? Yeah, uh, excited to be here. I am the Senior Manager of Integrated Marketing at Dr. Squatch. Um, I basically bring our marketing plans to life, um, manage marketing calendar, and kind of like do product marketing and um, bring things from start to finish um, cross-functionally across the company and then through um, execution on the marketing side. Okay, love it, love it. Um, now, Mason, can you please give us an intro of yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. Um, so Ms. Montgomery, Associate Director of Product Development here at Dr. Squatch. Um, so I basically take the products from idea through concept, through development, um, and ultimately land those in the market with our customers uh, and, and really try to drive the best product experience possible, including, you know, kind of the claims around the product, as well as obviously the, the function and, and the ingredients themselves. So um, yeah, it's been a great ride here at Dr. Squatch. Uh, Emily and I, I think both, both joined very early on. So, um, yeah, looking forward to talking to you today. Love it. Love it. Um, so before we dive into like the tactical things, I think it's helpful to have kind of like a background on Dr. Squatch, what you all do. Um, so I don't know who of you both want to take it, maybe take your own stabs at it. We can see, we can compare them. Um, but if one of you could provide just an intro level description, that would be great. Yeah, I can, I can start with one and uh, Mason can add or do his own. Love uh, Dr. Squash is a men's natural personal care brand. Um, we started with uh, natural cold process bar soap, and now we have a range of products from natural deodorant, hair care, lotion. We just launched a face wash. We have a great cologne. Um, and we basically make these really quality high performance products made specifically for men. Um, everything is 98 to 100% natural origin. Um, and yeah. Love it. Mason, anything you'd add on? Yeah, I, I would just say um, our fragrances, our scents are also really killer. Like, you know, when I'm talking to people on, you know, the technical side of the industry, um, natural as, as a brand, you know, uh, kind of platform can be a little bit controversial because there's different ways to define it. And, you know, what is, uh, natural in a regulatory sense isn't very clearly defined in the U S or internationally. And, um, something that I always kind of joke around when I'm telling people about the company is on the technical side is yeah, we're a natural product, but we're actually, a, like a fragrance brand that is natural in my opinion. Like that's what our customers like love about our products, the sense, um, you know, really manly inspired from like different nature, uh, you know, kind of, um, emotional transportive experiences is something that our, our founder really took, took to heart, um, 10 years ago when he started the company and, and that's continued through all of our product lines today. So, um, yeah, all, everything that Emily said, and then also just everything smells great, which we yeah. all <laughs> love, uh, being able to sell those products. So. Yeah, that's not a bad add-on, honestly. Like, especially for um something like a podcast where most of our listeners are tuning in um just with audio to be able to try and tap into the fragrance side of the brand is always always a fun one to do. Um okay, so I said that when before we hopped on this podcast, I paused myself because I wanted to ask like the rundown of the day to day. Because you you two are obviously different departments, I wanted to get the insight in towards how much are you guys working together? What does the day-to-day -day look like? Um, cause I, as a market sitting on the marketing team myself, I know we work very hand in hand with our product team. Um, but in a different way, obviously, because we're not, you know, we're not selling, um, we're not DTC. So what does the day-to-day -day look like? Like how much, I know you two both said you, um, were in the early days of Dr. Squatch. So how is that? Like, how's that been? How have you all worked together? I want, I want the ins and outs of it all. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm I'm happy to start, Emily, if that's if that's cool. Okay. Um yeah. So I would say it's it's definitely changed a lot over time as the company has grown. So I I, I was employee like I think 15 or so and like one of the very first product development hires. 
um, in Emily, you, you had to be like, what, like 10 or something, maybe even single digit, if I'm recalling eight. correctly. Yeah, eight. So when when we first started um, at the end of 2019, um, we were working obviously pretty closely together on a lot of projects. So like toothpaste, I still remember. Um, like we didn't, yeah, we didn't have, uh, you know, a really like a creative art team at the time or a packaging team. Um, and Emily and I like literally like were drawing the toothpaste container and like designing the copy and the art like on a whiteboard. And we were just like, this is going to be our toothpaste package. And now we have a completely different process where there's probably two or three teams in between us, um, <laughs> you know, in, in like kind of gatekeeping that. And we do have a packaging team and, and a creative art team and everything like that. So I would say it's, it's changed over time, but in the beginning that day to day was like, look, we have this concept. We wanted to do a morning and night toothpaste. And what does that really mean for a customer experience? Um, and we worked together on, on bringing that to life. And then, you know, I would kind of bring the product perspective and what were the ingredients that we could talk about. And then, and we'd be like, that's not a great product slogan. Let's make it a little bit more marketing <laughs> friendly. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think that was a, that was the early days and maybe Emily, you can talk a little bit about how it works, uh, day to day now. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to use the toothpaste example also. I have like very fond memories of that. It was, it was really fun. Yeah. Um, just Adding on to that a little bit, I think like early on, we didn't have any like process for bringing a product to market. So like Mason was working on this product and then everyone was like, okay, we're launching a toothpaste and on marketing, we were like, what's the toothpaste? Like what's, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> what do we say about the toothpaste? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I think for both of us, actually, that was a pretty cool experience to like, I got to be like way more involved in like the product development side and like thinking about how we're talking about our ingredients and like a really like deep level. And then Mason also got to be very involved in like the marketing and messaging side, which I think is something like, I, I don't know, but I think a lot of product people don't maybe get to experience that much. Um, and so that was like a very cool, I think, learning experience for both of us to like be really on the other side. Um, and yeah, like Mason said, now we have a variety of teams and we have a product strategy team. And so it's kind of a collaboration between product development, product strategy, you know, marketing, um, to kind of craft a story around the product. So, um, it's not like a simple handoff but like products not like okay this is the product we're launching it's like kind of a collaboration throughout even though Mason and I don't work directly together all the time I think our teams are pretty involved um and our teams are involved with other teams that are also bringing the product to life um so I think there's a lot of like collaboration on like the product claims and the like key functions and like the key benefits and the like why of why we're launching a product and like what the kind of core benefits are and what we want to bring to our audience. Yeah. I love that. So one of the things that I know I can relate to is like not having a process necessarily, and then having to discover along the way, maybe through some launches, um, or through some of the development of those launches, what that process should look like. And then obviously there are learnings to be had there. And I think it's so cool that you all got to see both, both of each, like both sides of each other's teams throughout it. Um, so I want to ask like, are there learnings that you had in those early days that you've carried through and changed like that process or changed the way, Emily, you're looking at the marketing side of things and then Mason, you're looking at the product development side of things. Cause I think a lot of listeners would love to hear, you know, whether whatever team they're sitting on the, uh, influences that that collaboration has. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think there are a lot of process changes. Like it's hard to even like think about a few because the whole, like, I think everything process wise has developed so much. Um, probably one of the earliest ones was like a like briefing process for like the product and then for the marketing team to like take that and turn it into a marketing brief. So I think that's probably one of like, probably the earlier ones that we worked on that we still have and it's like developed. And I think it's like much more involved and there are more people and like it's more formal, but I think that's probably one of the earliest ones that we were like, oh shoot, we need to like actually figure out a way that we're going to do this and like create a handoff and like where Mason can feel comfortable. Like he's spent months or years working on a product. Like he wants to feel comfortable that like marketing is going to talk about it in the right way and, you know, reach the right audience and 
um, really like bring this like product that's like his baby to life. And we want to feel confident that like, we know that we're talking about it in an accurate way. And, you know, we have the right information from him. And, and so I think like that handoff is probably like one of the earliest ones we worked on that um, has had a big impact, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think the first instance we did that was toothpaste. And it was almost like gear switching a little bit on the like R&D side with regards to the types of briefing. So clearly there's like, you know, the technical product brief of what we're actually going to do to make it. And then, you know, that question that, that Emily mentioned earlier, like, okay, like what story are we telling about this? We actually created a different brief for an internal marketing, like brainstorm that we had, um, which some really cool stuff came out of. So it was more like, I helped shape the, the kind of key pillars of what we were trying to do with the product. And then we still kept it like a, an open forum for us. And at the time, even with our founder and, and kind of like, you know, partnerships leads and stuff like that to figure out what are the, like some key hooks we could say about the product, even knowing like what the main function was, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and like one thing that came out of that was uh, the, was, I think it was the OJ test was what we, what we called yeah. it. Um, it was like a small like element of the technical like formula for a product where um, because of the different like cleanser we were using in the toothpaste, it didn't make, you know, orange juice taste bad like most toothpaste do after oh, you brush. And yeah. so like, oh, we should actually, you know, interview people on the street and like Venice Beach and, and get this on a video for some ads and like have people brush their teeth with our toothpaste and then drink some OJ afterwards. And it, you know, ended up being like five seconds of the hero video, but it still was like a really cool thing to be like, oh, like here's the OJ test. And, um, you know, then the marketing team like took that from the brainstorming discussion and obviously made a whole kind of like um, build around it. But I think, uh, you know, that was unique. Uh, I came from Unilever beforehand, and it was a very siloed development process. Um, I was on the R&D team there, and, and it was really just like kind of call and response and the marketing team, which was the brand kind of leads. They would have ideas about a product, and you would just kind of slot your formula in and, and you know, make a couple claims here or there, and that would be it. Um, but it's really been a collaborative process at Dr. Squatch, and I think that's led to um, some really highly reviewed and, and just kind of well-landed products. Um, you know, I think spray cologne is another one we can talk about where there was a lot of involvement throughout the development process before the product was even finalized, where um, we had our creative team run like different mock-ups of the like actual packaging that we were custom designing. Um, but they did add testing and A-B testing with that and saw like really what would land with customers. Then we funneled that in to actually make real decisions about like the final product that we were developing and tooling. Um, and, and it seemed to, to really take off after we launched. And I think when we have that type of collaboration rather than just handoffs, um, you just see the benefits in the product. That's awesome. I love, I love the, I love the, um, the like use cases, like hearing about the fragrances and the toothpaste, um, and like all the different things that obviously you can collaborate on, like the AB testing and ads, like running them beforehand before the products even developed, because I think as, as most people I would hope can agree with the more, you know, the more power behind, uh, um, behind an initiative, the better, and the more brains collaborating. And so those were perhaps like earlier days in the company. Um, and now you all are growing and killing the game, honestly. Um, so how, how has the team grown? Like how big are your teams? Um, can you go into like some details about that? Cause I want to go more into the product development, um, before we get into branding and all that, but I think it's good context for people to know, like what, what size of teens are you talking about through these stories? Emily, if you want to go first and then. Mason. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was started as number eight. Mason joined shortly after. And then I think the company's like 250 now. Is that right? Mason. -ish? Yeah, I think um, and I don't know actually how large the marketing team is. I want to say like maybe 50 people, but I'm making that number up. Um, it could, it could be, <laughs> it could be a ballpark. I'm not going to fact check you. Yeah. Unless you want, <laughs> unless you want um, to, <laughs> for, I guess some context, like we used to, you know, work with like one agency who did photography, who did video, who did copy. Um, we had a email agency. Um, and now we have in-house teams for a lot of that. So we have like an in-house photographer, we have an in-house packaging designer, we have um, in-house life cycle, we have 
all of that is, is in-house now. So we have kind of like a robust marketing team now, which is great. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, cool. Love it. Mason, what about you? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think you guys are maybe even like upwards of 80 on the marketing side. I, I think we started like product and marketing where we're relatively equal sized. And as the company has grown and we've cranked products out, we're, I think product team is probably around like 40 now. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think marketing, you guys definitely have us beat on the, on the head count these days, but um, I think, you know, as far as the individual teams too, like, like I mentioned, when I started, uh, there was one other person with a product development background who had started a week before me. Um, and now we have a robust, not just product development team, but also internal R and D teams. So we built out a lab. We um, have different formulation scientists with those backgrounds. Um, we have a whole packaging team now that uh, I helped build out and, you know, now is broken out and it's a team of four. Uh, so there's, there's just a lot of, I think they're hiring for a fifth now too. Um, so I think overall our product development R and D branches, we have like 15 people, something like that, um, with a couple of new people that we just added, whereas it was, you know, two, three for the first basically year and, and change of the company. Um, so definitely, uh, it's been, you know, basically it was a new company every quarter for the first mm -hmm. like three years as we went from, you know, the, the 15 to, you know, 250, 300 people that we have now. And so. And then we also have the product strategy team, which is like a new, right? Like that didn't exist when we started. And that's kind of like the, I think like the middle ground between like marketing and product development. Yep. Which is ah, okay. That's interesting. Do, is that common? Do you think like for other, um, like the D2C space? I don't know if I've heard of like a specific prodigy, product strategy team. I, I think it goes by a different name for us. Mm. So. And they do function a little bit differently from what traditionally would be like, I guess called like a brand manager type role. Um, since we've always had a very strong product development team and, and really liked having this, this flux in the strategy side, we kind of operate more as peers. And so it's like product development and product strategy together, concept, ideate these products. Um, and our product development team leans a little bit more R&D on one half of it as well. So we're kind of, I would say it's it's a unique setup for sure, and it always has been. Um, but you know, at a major CPG company, it would be similar to like a brand uh, brand marketing team. Um, that that's our product strategy. But they are a little bit more focused here at Squatch on how do you optimize like the portfolio, like what are the SKUs we want to be listing, delisting, like what are the you know new categories for us to explore that we really think are the highest opportunity, both from a market size perspective. Um, plus just our customer research perspective, um, which is something we really pride ourselves a lot in is, is hearing the voice of our customer. We can get, you know, survey data from our guys in a day or two and, and have like 2000 or 3000 responses. So we we're often really getting that, that voice of the customer, um, and, you know, top of mind when we're doing things. So that's kind of how the teams have evolved over time. Love it. Okay. So you just like rattled off like five or six different things that you all are doing. And like anyone knows, um, that listens to this podcast, I am on the marketing side. So I want to go into more of those details. Cause I, now that I have you on this podcast, it's so fascinating to me. So <laughs> I can't even pretend to <laughs> speak to all the things that you just said, um, like optimizing that portfolio and like focusing on specific SKUs and customer um, research and how you're letting that influence the R and D side of things. So can you dive into like, if I don't even know what the proper question phrasing would be, but like the cycle of how you're thinking through like a new product to add, um, to your catalog and like how you're thinking through, um, kind of, yeah, more of the, I guess, beginning cycle of adding a new product to your catalog. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I think there's probably three big factors that weigh into like what we prioritize from a new category development standpoint. Um, and so one is just our customer interest. So we know that there's a really strong ad adoption funnel for people that, you know, know and love our soaps into new categories. If we survey them and, and they say, yes, we have interest in buying a deodorant from Dr. Squatch or a lotion from Dr. Squatch. Um, so that there's definitely like capturing that voice of our like loyal brand customers. Um, 
in what they're looking for, but there's also layering that with market opportunities. So like what is actually growing in the market? Like maybe our customers um, aren't necessarily, you know, on the cutting edge of trends. So what is out there as far as like novel formats and like, how do we bring that to the table as well? And, and kind of weight these things um, appropriately for the cycle of the business. And then last, but, but definitely not least is just this idea of like, how do we innovate and just create new things as well that maybe aren't out there in the market or that our customers aren't really asking for. Um, now I think, that last piece is like heavily asterisk because we always will put something in front of our customers before we actually commit to doing it. Um, but, you know, I, I think a great example is um, we dabbled a little bit in hard goods a couple of years ago and it didn't really do anything crazy for our business, but we made some really cool products that were a part of that, that it's not like there was a huge market for, or, you know, a huge um, customer like, Hey, we really need a shower caddy from Dr. Squatch um type conversation but it was it was something that we we did explore and, and did create some really awesome moments for our customers through through doing that um whether it was like holiday promotions things like that and and so i think there is always that element of like how do you weigh all three of these factors and, and bring them together um to build a roadmap and we do that um for the first couple of years of the company it was basically like once a year because we're just moving so fast that um, it takes a long time to develop these products and okay, we, here's our pipeline discussion. What do we want to do? What do we want to prioritize? Um, and some of those from 2020 are just now hitting the market. Like as Emily wow. mentioned, we have face wash, spray cologne, deodorant, like those were lotion. Those were all parts of like some of those initial conversations, um, years ago. And, uh, now we're doing it a little bit more formalized with these teams that have, you know, developed and, and sprung up. So we have a commercialization team that kind of gatekeeps the way we put things through the funnel. Um, and we have like stage one, stage two, stage three for that. Um, and then the portfolio strategy team and product strategy team, like they are also really looking at this almost now on a, I think it's quarterly basis or at least half year is, is what we've done for the last year and a half. Um, and we're calling it like planning week where it's like, okay, like where do we fine tune the products that we already have in market? Like we need to make sure that those don't get outdated just because we launched them two years ago. And then where are we going to try to slot in some of our like big swings um, in the coming year or two from a new category standpoint. So it's, it's definitely well, well organized, well thought out. And, and I think, you know, props to the rest of the Squatch org for kind of setting that up pretty early on, honestly. Um, a lot of ex-consultants that came to work here for better or worse. And I think that uh, it really it really showed from that planning and like how we prioritize things. Yeah, yeah, that's super interesting. Okay, so because that all that's really like new new products, right? And so um, like when you were when you were speaking, I was also thinking about like, is there any element to like updating or fine tuning the current SKUs you have in your catalog or is it kind of like once they're launched like that is that is the whatever like the most perfect or best product possible because I know you mentioned also like listening to your customers and get it using those reviews so what does I guess like fine-tuning a product that's already launched look like and then Emily I promise we'll get to you with marketing questions don't you worry you're good you're good um I can also speak to I'll speak to maybe like cat like optimization of our kind of portfolio and then we can talk about like specific product development if that works for this one love it um so yeah we have you know we have like a ton of SKUs and we obviously when we put something out we want it to be like the absolute best that it can be and like we believe that it is at the time and but Mason will go into like improvements um but we also are looking at like our full like portfolio and what makes sense together and we have this whole like scent strategy so we have you know, some scents that don't go across categories, like for example, gold moss um, is like a bar soap. I think we've had around since definitely since before I started, I think since the OG days. Um, but it's not like a scent that we have across multiple categories. It's just bar soap. Um, but then there are other scents that are like core scents. So like Birchwood Breeze, Wood Rail Bourbon, Fresh Falls, things like that, where we have them across multiple product categories. And those are like what we call our tent poles um where we like basically think they're gonna crush across the board people love them like if we've launched it as a soap it's like become one of our top sellers and we're like okay people will want this in you know a deodorant form or hair care or a modification of it as a cologne or something and so just optimizing our like portfolio around um 
what our customers love and want and like having enough optionality, but not so much that we're like overwhelming people and, and, you know, contributing to like option paralysis. Um, so we're always kind of thinking about like, okay, if we are going to launch this new scent, like, is there something we should sunset or is there something that is like in a different scent group that, you know, we're in a scent group that's maybe like underserved a little bit. Like if we don't have enough fresh scents, for example, like, should we add a fresh scent or should we replace one of these old scents with something new that people might like more? So, um, we're always like kind of optimizing the portfolio as a whole. Yeah. I love that. I think that's a really key like that. I think there's just so much, like the more I talk to people on this podcast and like every single industry and every single team that there is, like, there's just so many details that as an average consumer, um, if you don't work in this business, you wouldn't think about like sense strategy. That is so fascinating to me that you're like thinking through, okay, what, what different things across the board would this scent work for across different SKUs and even like bundling capacity, right? Like gifts, like seasonality, everything that goes into that. Um, or even like limited edition launches. Right. Um, so thank you, Emily. I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, like detail that we don't usually get to go into on this podcast. So it's really exciting to hear about. Yeah. Mason, do you want to follow up or yeah, add some, add some key opinions in that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think Emily like hit it on the head there with regards to like, we don't want to overwhelm our customers. And so you'll see like there are competitive male personal care brands that have like three, four times the number of SKUs that we have. Um, you know, I think still since we've been at the company, like it's crazy to look back and see how many products we've launched in you know different sense views, but there, there are so many more that we could have that we decided weren't the right investment or would kind of dilute the value of, of our brand with our customers um, in these core areas. So, um, you know, on the, on the topic of sunsetting, right? Like we had a scent for a really long time. That was a best loved soap scent. It was called Cedar Citrus. Um, you know, really natural woodsy scent. Um, and we started to expand that into a couple other categories. We launched a deodorant and we saw that it just wasn't really loved in some of these other categories by our customers. And so there was a very like technical element of, you know, this heavy woody scent like doesn't do well outside of soap in things like a cologne or um, a deodorant where you're kind of, you don't want to smell just like a tree. Um, and <laughs> Like, while it was such a great, you know, kind of like seller for our soap, we found that um, people actually reviewed it a little bit more poorly than they, than you would expect for how highly it was purchased. So there was like this little bit of disconnect, like people loved the name Cedar Citrus, but then when they actually were using the product, we looked into that insight and we're like, okay, like clearly there's something here, like maybe we should create something else that evokes the same, you know, quick uh, kind of like resonance with customers on the purchasing side, on the merchandising side of the marketing team. But also has a product that's supporting it that's like a lot stronger um, from a performance standpoint that would allow us to expand into things like shampoo and conditioner and um, you know some of these other categories that we're trying to push into. So I think it was a great example of like what Emily is saying of you know not just looking at it from the like marketing perspective of how many SKUs we want to show on our homepage funnel for the bundles for things like that, but then also like where the insights of the product formula underlying can help drive like those decisions. And we ended up delisting Cedar Citrus and replacing it with um, some other scents that we feel uh, are honestly doing quite a bit better and, and really performing in, in places like retail and, and uh, beyond. So. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I think also the option is it option paralysis. Is that what you called it? Yeah. Right. Okay, cool. I love it. I love it. Um, so like, yeah, just having so many things on, on your side, like coming from a marketing standpoint of not wanting your customers to be overwhelmed by the decision. Um, I would, I think that's a great point into why you'd sunset a, a, um, scent or a, a particular product. And that reminded me that I wanted to discuss the ads and like the AB testing that goes into once you have a product that is maybe through the R and D stage, um, that the product strategy team is working on, um, and kind of creating that bridge between you have the ideal product or you have an idea for it. 
and going more towards like, how are you thinking about marketing it? Um, so Emily, if you could go into more of the strategy about, about like what you want the consumer to see around like the branding of new products and, um, maybe sunsetting other products or fine tuning them. I think that would be really interesting. And then Mason, obviously as well, if you'd like to tune in. Um, yeah, I'll talk, maybe I'll go into like overall, like bringing a product to market first, and then we can talk more about like sunsetting or, or things like that. Cause I think it's a little bit of a different thing. Um, but yeah, like, I think, like we said, it's a very collaborative process with product, product strategy, marketing. So we, you know, work on like the product story and the positioning really closely um, with the team. And then once we have like all of the final information, we've kind of aligned on like the kind of story direction. Um, we put it into a marketing brief and begin to like brainstorm how we want to position the launch. So sometimes that'll be like Mason mentioned for Cologne, we did like pre-launch testing of different types of messaging and visuals and things like that. And then we took those insights to build out like actually what the campaign plan was going to be. Um, and we did, you know, we kind of used like the winners from that initial test to determine like the direction we wanted to move forward in. Um, that's not something we do always, but for that like particular launch, it made a lot of sense. For everything, it doesn't make sense because we're obviously going to do so much like testing with creative anyway that we can, you know, test five different messages and pick, pick one, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but for that particular one, it made sense. And we do a lot of surveying in terms of like what claims are most important to people, like different ways that we can message that, um, even if it's not like a direct, like creative survey. Um, but yeah, we'll put it into marketing brief and like brainstorm how we want to position the launch and then brainstorm like what channels we want to test out, um, if we want to try anything new, and then like who we would need to engage to make that happen. So whether that is, you know, engaging the product strategy, customer insights teams, or engaging a new agency, or, you know, getting a new, um, a new partner or a new influencer to, to help promote it. Um, kind of just like thinking through all that. And then once we have like a, a plan built out, we, you know, obviously start scripting and creative direction and all that. And we, um, again, I think the middle part is maybe a little more siloed into like marketing. And then we basically bring in like product development product strategy and compliance to like review all of our scripts, copy for the website, um, all of that to like get their inputs on how we're messaging the product and like the product story and if we're getting it right. So I think from start to finish, it's pretty, pretty collaborative. Mm -hmm. I love it. Love it so much. Mason, yeah. anything you would add? I, I would just, I would just like applaud the marketing team more like I know like honestly like what you guys have done in the past couple of years has been incredible on the advertising side and like I know like so our creative team has sort of broken out a little bit and, and done a ton of A-B testing with different ads right like just so and Emily you could probably speak more to this but talking to you know some of our partners over there when, when I'm helping review some of the claims like we we test like how many I think at certain times for some of our core soap ads, like maybe like 20 versions of like the three seconds at the beginning, like what is the hook that's going to get somebody to like really pay attention to this ad and, and, you know, where ad attention spans are getting slow, like, you know, kind of less and less seconds per fewer seconds per like, you know, ad, ad grab that you're trying to get people on. And so like some of our most successful deodorant ads have been us showing slicing of soap I like almost ASMR like, and then deodorant is like two or three seconds in like, Hey, buy our deodorant. It's just not even connected to the actual product that we're selling. But the, the ad development team has been like, yes, this, this ad kills when you're showing, you know, slicing of soap, like let's just make sure we run it for some of these other products. Um, so just really interesting things like that, where, uh, I think we've really leveraged those insights and, and responded in real time to, you know, what the marketing team is trying to push for there. Um, and that obviously has a lot of interface with the web team as well, um, on, on our landing pages and things like that. But I think I, I still like that deodorant ad with the soap slicing. Like I, I use that example a lot because it's just, it's so counterintuitive to like, if you're like, if you're writing a plan on, on a page of like what you want to do for an advertisement for deodorant, you don't think slicing soap, but then we found out that that just, you know, does great for us on Instagram. So, um, just cool things like that, I think are, are fun to keep in mind. Yeah. There's definitely a, um, 
element of like randomness, but there's also like more overarching what we're trying to do, which is like to, I think, bring our mission to life in different ways across our marketing and across all of our different product launches. So our mission is to inspire and educate men to be happier and healthier. And um, that's kind of what we're doing like on social and with all of our content is this like really unique way of educating people. Um, so sometimes it's like random, like Mason's saying, like the soap cutting is like a very cool visual. Um, sometimes it's like just like funny stuff or weird visuals or whatever. But, um, at the end of the day, like when you bring it back, it's like, it is education through, um, entertainment and humor, which is like really how we reach all of our customers. So all of our products have like these really strong value props and like really like great benefits and they're amazing products. Um, and so we talk about all those benefits and the benefits of using natural products um, and why it's important through this like kind of humorous lens. And that's how we kind of engage with our audience. Yeah. I love that point that you bring up where there's, there's like, it's multi multifaceted, right? Where there's the umbrella of the overall goal. Like, what are you trying to do? You're trying to live out your mission statement, which is a great one, by the way. Um, and trying to do that in multiple or in different ways so that like you're catering to all different types of audiences, like entertaining people through, um, through, you know, the real or Instagram post of the soap cutting, um, which totally, I think would work on me. Cause I'm like ASMR that's like TikTok. I mean, the amount of videos that, um, trending or, or tri- TikTok or, um, Instagram or even YouTube shorts with things that like perhaps aren't related, but they're just entertaining to watch. Like that's the baseline of it. Um, I think that's a really good lesson for, for those who are looking maybe to try and launch a new product of testing it out. Um, and I think having it always connect back to the mission statement or the overarching goal is something that kind of seems like you should, it should always be top of the mind, but it sometime could slip when you get so, um, so caught up in the details of things. And so I would love to dive more into like education, obviously Malomo post-purchase experience. We are all about educating a customer while their, um, order is on their way to be delivered to someone. So it's the topic that we discuss a lot. Um, so I'd love to get both of your opinions on it in terms of like, how are you thinking about educating the customer, whether it's through, um, you know, the ads that you're putting out there or what you're putting on the marketing site or even the post-purchase experience, we can dive into that a bit. Um, I think that would be really entertaining. Yeah. So, um, you know, after you purchase, like, I think we focus a lot on education around those products. So for example, like we'll have a blog post that I think was written like forever ago, but it's still really relevant where like, if you buy soap for the first time, like maybe you'll get information about how to extend the life of your bar soap. Um, and that might include a thing about a soap saver, which you probably should buy if you didn't get one, because it makes your experience a lot better, but like, it's true. It does make the experience a lot better. And like people who buy a soap saver, like have a better experience with the soap and like come back more. So educating them about like why that actually is important, like what you can do. Cause I think one of the misconceptions is like bar soap doesn't last a long time or a misconception is like natural deodorant doesn't work. And so like showing them that like, if you, you know, these are steps you can take to have the best experience possible. Um, or like, these are the things that you can expect, right. Switching from, you know, an aluminum antiperspirant to a natural deodorant and like preparing them for what that experience might entail. Um, so there definitely is a good amount of education, um, around like kind of how to have the best experience and, and why like natural products are important and why you should be using them. Um, I think in terms of like retention though, the, the bottom line is it has to be a great product. Um, so I always say like, once people get the product, they should be a customer for life because it's so good. Um, and I truly believe that. So um, I think that's like probably the first thing is making sure you have a top-notch product and then everything else kind of follows. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I love that you brought retention into it as well. Cause I think that's um, obviously this is retention chronicles, right? We say it on like nearly every episode um, focusing on retention. It's also one of those things that 
I personally feel like it's of more importance now because our acquisition has traditionally just been more and more expensive throughout the years. Um, so yeah, I love that you wrote deten- retention into education, um, and thinking through like, what are the misconceptions that you all can help, um, educate your consumers on so that they have a better experience. Mason, I see you shaking your head. You agree with that? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I think you can tell that we've had success with it because you see customers educating each other as well. Like on our mm. Instagram posts, like on our, we have like a scrub club Facebook group that started as like kind of like a CX VIP um, type group. And now I, I don't know what the latest count is, but it's in the tens of thousands, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think it, I think the audio cut out, but Emily, you were saying, I think 30 was what I saw or something. Yeah. Um, so 13, okay. 13, got it. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that like, you know, we sent out for deodorant, for instance, like a detox from, you know, aluminum deodorant to, um, our, our product and what you expect to see, you know, from a like physical body and like formula interaction change over time. Um, and I remember seeing people like on the Instagram post after a couple of months, like commenting to people saying like, Hey, like just give it a couple of weeks. Like you know, your body will adjust blah, blah, blah. And that's when I was like, okay, we were actually doing a really solid job here of like spreading the message about these products and, um, you know, potential like insights that people can have to, to utilizing them better. So definitely agree. And, um, sometimes it's overt like that. Sometimes, uh, you know, I think hair care and, and kind of our existing shampoo and conditioner that we have out there as well was something that our founder at the time was really into trying to change people's routines about. Um, you know, that's a difficult thing to do, but our shampoo bottle is eight ounces and our conditioner is 12 ounces as a result. Um, because we're trying to tell guys that you shouldn't shampoo every single day, but you can condition every day. And so, like, the formula itself was this was before um, any of us were at the company, but was designed uh, to kind of support that as well. So the conditioner is like a really light one that can be used every day. Um, and even though we had a video where we were educating people about it, even though we you know had it on the package itself, like it really, you really get through to people when they're like, why is this smaller? Oh, that's why. Um, and so that, I thought that was always an interesting thing too, because I, I don't think I've seen any other like male brand out there try to do that. Um, and, you know, Maybe we don't do that forever, but I think it's something that was just a really interesting experience for the last three years. And we obviously sell quite a bit of the product. So I think people, um, you know, resonated with that. Yeah, that's a cool example also, because now, now I feel like that's common knowledge, like at least with women, it's like wash your hair like once a week, maybe yep. twice, you know, and I, I feel like it used to not be so common of a thing. And I feel like Squash was kind of early on that, on that trend. So that's a cool one. Yeah. I didn't even know that you all had like the different size bottles. And when you said that, I was like, oh my God, that's so genius. <laughs> like, why isn't that common practice? Um, so yeah. And like, I, I have pretty long hair. So like, I, like you said, Emily, like as a woman, I know, like now it's, I feel like more, um, it's more normalized to like shower and rinse your hair once or twice a week, like you said, but even like the notion that like, I have to plan in my mind, I'm like, I buy like different levels of shampoo and conditioner. Like I'll go through one of the bottle, like the, what is it? The shampoo or the conditioner way quicker than I'll go through the shampoo for that reason, because they're the same size bottle. So it's like almost a two to one ratio. Um, so every, every brand, um, should, think through such an innovative response to that because one, yes, you capture the cu- the customer's attention because they're like, what? Like, that's not something you're used to seeing. And then it all, and through that, you open up the avenue of being able to educate them and be like, oh, this is why. Like, it's not that your product, you know, like delivery got messed up or anything like that. Like it's intentionally like this because of this reason. And then to have that content to back up or explain further why that decision was made. Um, yeah, it like you said, it leaves such a lasting impact that now people on uh, Instagram are commenting to help educate other people because they're like, I did the same thing. Um, and it also reminded me of we had um, Lexi Monty come on the podcast. She's 
um, VP of marketing and comms at happiest baby, which they have like the snoo, if you, if you two have heard of that. Um, and she was saying how like Instagram comments are basically becoming the new, um, the new like reviews on a website in that like people, when they're shopping, obviously like on Instagram or talk, TikTok, um, cause now they've made those updates to be shoppable. That's what people are looking at rather than maybe a couple of years before where you're looking on a website to see what the, re- what the reviews are on the website. You're looking at those comments from someone on Instagram, like scrolling through their posts, looking at, you know, is this a brand that is reputable? Like, am, am, am I making sure that I'm not, um, making a purchase that, you know, isn't gonna, isn't gonna go well. Um, so I think it's great that you all have seen the impact of that education, even down to like individuals taking it upon themselves to educate other people within your community. Yeah. I mean, there also is like a whole side of our Instagram where everyone's just like, can I eat the soap? Can I drink the hair care? And we're like, (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure. Yeah. It kind of goes, it's the wild, wild west a little bit (laughs) along with that. But you know, like, I don't know what the actual ratio is, but like every hopefully one-to-one where it's like wild, wild west, and then also credible, helpful information. Um, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's awesome. I mean, honestly, jokes like that, though, have been such like, uh, I don't know, when you talk about retention, like there, there's such an aspect of our brand that, I mean, for lack of a better word, it's a little culty. Like there, there are really obsessed Dr. Squatch fans. Like I've seen people post photos in like the Facebook group of like a pyramid of deodorant that they bought. Like they're never <laughs> going to get that much deodorant in their whole life, really. But it's it's something where it's like, you think of that element of the brand and people like making jokes about eating the soap for years and years and years because it smells so good. And then we have to be like, as a brand, like, no, don't eat the soap. Like, when they- <laughs> please don't do that. <laughs> yeah. um, like there's just that, that level of, I guess it's maybe like real, like honest engagement with our customers, both on the education side, both on the joking and humor side that it do creates this like sense of community that like does retain customers for, for longer. And, um, you know, like I mentioned, I, I worked on a range of like really well-known mass brands before coming to Dr. Squatch and none of my, I had access to free product all the time at Unilever. Like none of my friends like switched to St. Ives because I was working on St. Ives. I have like half a dozen, maybe even like a dozen friends and family now who are always like, where's the next Squatch products? Like, can you bring some home? Like everyone loves it. And like, they feel like they're a part of something. Um, and you know, I, I had been an old spice man my whole life and like had never changed even when I was working at, you know, Unilever and Dove and these other products. And then we launched our, you know, Dr. Squash deodorant and my, not just myself, but also my wife and like some of my best friends have like been using the deodorant for years now. Um, and it's just, I, I think there's just something to say for that too, of like the brand is fun, the brand is honest. And like that also keeps people feeling like they're a part of, of something that they want to keep purchasing. Yeah. I love, I love that. So you basically need that pyramid of deodorant so you can give it out to all your friends and family. (laughs) Sounds like you're already, you're already on that motion. (laughs) Um, yeah, I think it's, I think that's what it comes down to. A lot of the times I find, um, like some of those inexplicable, just like moments of connection with a brand and then a consumer, um, which is obviously very difficult to like be able to try and pinpoint like what that even means or what it means to a customer or what it means to a brand in those like moments that you can laugh and see like, okay, this is what the community is like. Like you have inside jokes and you have people who are in this Facebook community, like whatever, helping each other, like it, laughing with each other. Um, it's really fun and special. And I feel like the deed, like the, it's in, from a consumer point of view, like even outside of, um, working in the space of e it's like, that is what a like a uh, a trademark or like a stamp of a DTC brand is where they have that like loyalty or they have that fun brand behind them that people also connect with and continue to buy from that brand because of like the community that it offers or the education or the laughs that it offers whatever reason they stick by um yeah, yeah. so i love that emily anything you'd add before we wrap up this amazing episode any, yeah. any pyramids of deodorant that you've seen on Instagram? <laughs> oh my God. So many. I mean, I, I have like a, I have my own pyramids. Like I, I have all of our limited edition soaps like that we've ever launched in both new and old branding. Um, 
in like a bookshelf and I always add to it and it's like getting a little bit overwhelming, but I'm, I feel like one of the, one of those people, I feel like you're keeping it going. (laughs) Yeah. All of, you'll see like all of our like backgrounds on zoom are like bookshelves of squatch, like, so that's so cool. Yeah. Turn it into interior design. There you go. I love it. Well, this has been such an amazing episode. I'm sad that we've already gone through, um, the hour, which is crazy, but thank you both so much for making the time. Um, it's always fun to have people on the podcast, getting to connect with others and mainly giving the platform for you all to share with our listeners, um, and provide so much value. So really thank you for taking the time to do so today. It's been amazing. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Of course. Of course. Thank you.